My late friend, good friend, Neil Horsley, who ran for governor in Georgia, used to observe, he lived through the 1960s sexual revolution and participated in it, and he used to observe that sodomy, sodomy was the avant-garde of the sexual revolution, because if, if that could be normalized, or at least accepted, because of the natural revulsion that most people have to the act of sodomy, um, then it was, it was a protection for all the other sexual revolutionaries, because whatever their particular uh, sin that they were in love with, or sexual act that they were in love with, was, or fetish that they loved the most, would be protected if they could normalize the one that, that had, you know, that represented an act that is most universally recoiled from by the most people. And that would be the act of sodomy. People just, m most people, the majority of people just naturally find it uh, vile, uh, especially the, the physiological act, the act of inserting the penis into the rectum of, of another human being. You know, until at some level people are conditioned, the vast majority of people uh, recoil from it. And that's why the vast majority of, of sodomy propaganda does not, you know, does everything in its power to avoid referring to that aspect of it or conjuring those images. Now, lately, as as the propaganda progresses over the decades, they get closer and closer and closer to, to um, conditioning the entire society in an Orwellian sense to uh, finally, you know, begin to normalize even thinking about um, sodomy through uh, the, the proliferation of pornography and mixing it uh, all up and, and all the propaganda in the schools. But, but initially, the human condition, the natural uh, way that human beings, most human beings, the majority, are wired, people recoil from the physiology of sodomy. And so in that context of sodomy as the avant-garde of the sexual revolution, that um, first line of offense that, that um, as the best defense, a good offense is the best defense, that, that guarded all the other, uh, the fornicators, you know, the other, all the other sexual revolutionaries. I mean, unless you go all the way to talking about bestiality, which now that's in the, uh, more and more increasingly uh, bestiality and uh, the sexual abuse of uh, children, pederasty and pedophilia are in the uh, public dialogue more and more and more. But Really, it was sodomy that was the avant-garde. In that context, I want to talk about three Orwellian uh, nonsense words, words that in and of themselves and by their nature represent etymological cognitive dissonance. And we've been conditioned to two of them in particular, and the third a little bit less, but the first one is uh, homosexuality or homosexual. Let's go with homosexual. Uh, this is a nonsense word that if you study its uh, philological or etymological origins began, I believe, around the year 1900 or 1901. Uh, it's been a while since I, I, I read through the, the origin of it, but I, I, as I recall, 1900 or 1901, etymologists uh, decried it at the time, but a, just a quick uh, word study of the roots, of the Greek root, uh, of the Greek roots, of this word uh, shows that it is a nonsense word. Uh, the fact that a man puts his, let's say it this way, the fact that uh, one man uses another human being's rectum as a masturbatory aid does not change his intrinsic sexuality, okay? Any more than if a man, uh, and there are people out there who, who say this nowadays, this is the point of cognitive dissonance and and uh, this is how deeply cut off from reality people's minds have become, that there are actually people who claim that they are asexual, for example. Asexual, they will say, I am asexual because I exclusively masturbate. And so I'm in love with myself. There was a person in the news recently, I forget if it was a man or a woman, who, who got married, quote-unquote, to himself, right? He did a ceremony and he got married to himself. In reality... There is a, a thing such as biological reality, and 
that person is not asexual. Just because he, uh, he or she exclusively uh, masturbates and uses him, you know, whatever part of his body or whatever he uses as a masturbatory aid, his intrinsic sexuality, he's a, which is a, a biological characteristic, has not changed. He is not a sea anemone, okay? He is not an earthworm. Now, an earthworm is probably not a good example because it's a true hermaphrodite. An earthworm can actually reproduce sexually with another earthworm or sexually with itself because it actually has sexuality built in a male end and a female end. So that would not be, that would be maybe in a broad category, uh, asexual, but a sea anemone, okay, or a starfish can reproduce asexually. That is an asexual creature, a person who exclusively masturbates. His physiology and his biology has not changed. He's just uh, doing it wrong, right? He's just uh, a sexual creature who reproduces sexually, that's his nature, who is abusing himself. And, and there's no amount, even if he abuses himself in a particular way, his entire life, that does not change his intrinsic sexuality, okay? This is nonsense. This is Orwellian newspeak taken to an extreme. Taken to an extreme. So, in the same way in which a person who exclusively masturbates with, with himself uh, is not going to wake up one day and be a sea anemone and find, uh, you know, a, another one of himself now coming out of his hand. You know, he's not going to give birth to to a clone of himself through a hole in his hand. Or, or Okay, so in the same way, uh, a man who uses a woman or another man's rectum as a masturbatory aid is not a homosexual. Because homo would mean in fact, the word itself would not even mean that. The word homo, meaning the same, and sexuality, meaning sex sexuality. That's a method of reproduction. So, human beings, in that sense, are uh, homosexual. We are all share the characteristic of being sexual. Uh, homo, how do you pronounce it? In uh, theology, homoousine is the... Uh, from the Nicene Creed is the characteristic that God the Father and God the Son share a nature. So they share the same homo, the same nature. And human beings share homo, the same sexuality. That's what that word would mean. But there's no need for such a word. That's why it didn't come around until 1900. And the etymologists, again, who were mostly called philologists at that time, decried it at the time. Uh, it is a nonsense word. It has no biological significance. Uh, it is not, there's no nature of a creature that reproduces uh, male with male. There's no such thing. It's just the use of a man, the habitual use by a man of uh, a rectum as a masturbatory aid. And there's already a word for that. It's called sodomy. And it doesn't change anyone's intrinsic nature. Now, I'm not denying that people can rewire their brains by their actions, and that people people can, uh, and that other people abusing other people can re rewire their, their souls and condition their souls in a particular way. So I'm not even denying that the nature of a person can be affected, okay, by the habitual acts, they, but the, it doesn't transform uh, a person who is a created physiologically, sexually, into another category, a biological category of reproduction. That's That doesn't happen, and it is a fantasy. Now, so that's homosexual. Number two, gay. Uh, you know, gaiety, uh, there is no connection between gaiety and sodomy. There's nothing gay about it. Uh, frivolity, uh, you know, drinking, wine, all these things in people who are wired and have conditioned themselves to engage in sodomy may lead to sodomy, but um, the concept of gaiety and frivolity is in no sense intrinsically uh, linked to uh, sodomy, and it is a masking word, and again, it's an avant-garde word, a word d designed in an Orwellian sense, a new speak word designed to conceal the, ph the physiologically repulsive act of sodomy. It, so it's a, uh, a way to manipulate the minds of people by, um, by using a, 
word for frivolity to mask the, the hideous nature of an abominable act. So, so there's no uh, correlation uh, between, except an accidental one, between gaiety and the act of sodomy. Uh, so that one I just dismiss. Uh, the person is not a gay, the person is not uh, engaging in gaiety, the person is, and the Bible doesn't <clears throat> uh, use that term, the person who engages in sodomy is a sodomite engaging in the act of sodomy. His biological nature hasn't changed, uh, the act is not uh, an act of uh, joyful frivolity or gaiety, uh, there's nothing gay about it, all right? Number three, homophobia. Homophobia, again, according to its uh, root words, ought to mean that uh, the one who is homophobic is afraid of things which are homo, which are the same. Okay, so identical twins, Mormon missionaries, uh, what else would be the same? Ch a pair of chopsticks, you know, they're all, they all look the same, right? Anything that someone perceives as looking the same, that would be a homophobe, it would be someone who has... This uh, phobia, this diagnosis of being uh, inordinately or illogically or unreasonably or uh, irrationally afraid of things that are, that are the same. So, I'll end it there. Pardon me. Three nonsense words that come from the uh, brainwashing of the sexual revolution with sodomy as its avant-garde. And by entering into the framework of these nonsense words in this new speak, we have already lost the battle because we are fighting the battle. Once we are begin to fight a war within the frame, the, the philosophical and etymological framework and the linguistic framework of the enemy, uh, you've already you've already uh, shot yourself in the foot. You've already predetermined your own failure because you're using the nonsense words that were uh, dictated to you by the culture that had already been overtaken by the sexual revolutionaries. And we have to stop doing it, okay? Teach ourselves. I'm, I'm struggling with it myself because repetition is very powerful, but we're never going to win when we allow them to impose, by them, I mean the sexual, rev sexual revolutionaries, to impose their nonsense Orwellian newspeak on us. When we do, we have already lost.